Hello and welcome to the second instalment of an occasional series we're calling Asiki Talks. I'm Linda McCaffrey. I'd firstly like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country upon which we meet, the Larrakia peoples, and pay my respects to their elders and an as ancestors past and present. My respects also go to all Australian Indigenous peoples, both in the room and in the wider audience, and to their extended families everywhere. And happy NAIDOG week. Distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, Asiki students and staff, ladies and gentlemen. This gathering marks the second episode, as we like to call it, in a series of talks produced and presented by the Australian Centre for Indigenous Knowledges and Education, or as we call it up here in the Territory, Asiki. Asiki Talks is designed to showcase the expertise and talents of Asiki's contributing academics and our current aspirational and higher education students. To give them the opportunity to tackle the big issues in their discipline or their field of study and in Indigenous education and politics in general, both to a local audience like yourselves or a national audience. Today the focus is on NAIDOC week for 2014, the national theme with a slightly twisted shift. We're going to serve country or talk about serving country, but pre-centenary and beyond and slightly broader than the military. In a little while you'll hear from incoming Chief Executive Officer of the North Australian Land and Sea Management Alliance, Robert, but better known as Bo, Khan, about the way in which caring for country matters perhaps as much as defending country. But first, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Adesiki. Dr. Sue Stanton is a Kanarakan Gurindji woman, born in Larrakia land. Dr. Stanton took history in a double major undergraduate degree from the Northern Territory University, which is in fact this one, only a little later, in Australian history and Northern Territory history. Uh, Southeast Asian civilizations and religions, aspects of European revolutionary histories. She then completed a PhD with Charles Darwin University, becoming the first Aboriginal student to complete a research PhD at CDU, and that was in 2007. Dr. Stanton's PhD thesis was entitled Coloreds and Catholics, a Colonial Subject's Narrative of the Factors and Processes that Led to the Colonization and Conversion of Coloreds at Garden Point Mission, 1941 to 1967. Dr. Stanton is also a Fulbright Scholar who took an MA in American Indian Studies at University of Arizona Tuscan in Arizona, specialising in international law and Indigenous people's rights at the James E. Rogers College of Law, UA. Pretty impressive. Australian National Internship Program, Australian National University in the office of Senator Margaret Reynolds, Parliament House. She's also worked at Canberra as a recipient of the Australian, sorry, I beg your pardon, Parliament House in Canberra. She is a recipient of the Australian Government Scholarship for Overseas Study in Minorities Leaders Fellowship Program, Washington DC, in the office of Reverend Jesse Jackson and the National Urban Coalition. Academic component completed in Southwestern University, Waterfront, Washington DC. Now I could go on about Dr. Stanton, but I shan't. Her bio is rather extensive. If you'd like to know more about Sue, you should probably Google her like everybody else does. Currently, she's employed as a senior lecturer here at ASIKI and she runs several degree programs. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Sue Stanton on serving country pre-colonisation and beyond. Thank you, Linda. Make me sound a bit scary. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, well today, uh, first I'd like to acknowledge Larrakia people and in Larrakia country in which I was born and I'm always proud to um, announce that. Um, I'd also like to honour all my Kongarakan and Gurindji ancestors and the sacrifices they've made and I, I'm really pleased to see um, Lenore here today, um, another Kongarakan in the room here with me. Um, I also acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patriots, patriots who died defending their countries so that we might enjoy the freedom and privileges we have today. Um, and I welcome you all here today as well. 
Um, and before I start, I wanted to say that NAIDOC week should also be a time of reflection and remembrance and acknowledgement, as well as the celebration of our survival. Recently, during a cross-cultural workshop designed for people from the multicultural and multi-ethnic community organisation sector, a few participants inquired whether Aboriginal people made any efforts to resist the invading British at any time during the so-called settlement phase. This was a serious question that needed to be answered, but due to the nature of the workshop we were in and also due to time restraints, we could not pursue this subject matter. It was agreed by the facilitator and the participants that such a topic certainly required attention and some discussion as it was agreed that most people do not have any knowledge of the history of Aboriginal resistance. It is hard to perceive that people would have the notion that Aboriginal people were passive recipients of British colonialism and that they embraced the idea of invasion and colonisation. However, in large part, this is the case. Most cannot seem to make a link back to what must have occurred in the early days of the invasion of Aboriginal Australia. Yet the reasons for invasion and the processes may have different aspects and indeed even different purposes and different players but the essential pattern of invasion is the same. And the essential defence of homelands is driven by the same motivations. And I'm think, talking about that in a contemporary context as well. So in many different places around the world where there are still resident Indigenous peoples who just happen to be living smack bang in the middle of development, who also feel the full impact of invasion and dispossession, after all, it is about progress, about the opening up of frontiers. It is invasion and dispossession, the continuum of colonialism, regardless of who the coloniser or who the dispossessor is. Even at local, local level, government, along with developers, march over the lands of Aboriginal people, all in the name of progress and dollars. And sadly, even some of the once colonised have joined the ranks of the more powerful non-Aboriginal coloniser class and now sell off what is left of their hard fought for ancestral estates. Dollars have replaced guns and other machinery of war. And it seems in a number of places, even sacred ancestral lands are no longer worth fighting for. A long history exists of Aboriginal people serving country, of defending their ancient ancestral estates, commencing from the onset of British invasion, back then trying to maintain lands and boundaries whilst adapting to ongoing frontier violence, to today's continued adjustment and pressure to modernise, to develop and advance with the rest of Australian society, without endangering communal identity and sacred traditions. However, first we must explore the myth that Aboriginal people gave minimal resistance to British invasion and domination. First, we must restore the memories of the Aboriginal heroes and heroines to their rightful place in both Aboriginal and Australian national consciousness. From Pemulwuy, from the East Coast, Australia's first patriot who resisted the enemy in 12 years struggle that ended with his death in September 1800 to Jandamara from the west coast and the thousands in between. Aboriginal people not only defended themselves and their countries whilst adapting to new ways but their military defence of their lands and methods of war and survival have been mostly underrated unrecorded and not considered as fighting for country. Among the first wars involved Aboriginal people trying to protect their lands from intruders took place in early 19th century Tasmania, or as it was known then, Van Diemen's Land. 
However, even though those early frontier wars between Aboriginal residents and invading British colonists have been described as conflicts and skirmishes, from an Aboriginal perspective, these may be better described as wars between enemies. Just as they occur in any other war theatre, in any other part of the world, where locals or residents wish to protect their lands and resources from outside conquerors. The black war that raged in Tasmania between Aboriginal people and illegal British authority and colonists during the period commencing in 1804 was directly linked to challenges that Aboriginal people made about land theft in particular. The British reacted by imposing martial law that was around 1828, on the local Aboriginal population, who they actually had no jurisdiction over in the first place. And by the time martial law was imposed, and after many years of guerrilla tactic warfare practised by Tasmanian Aboriginal people, the Colonial Times and the Tasmanian Advertiser of 1st December 1826 declared... We make no pompous display of philanthropy. We say this unequivocally. Self-defence is the first law of nature. The government must remove the natives. If not, they will be hunted down like wild beasts and destroyed. The self-defence is the first law of nature was not a right afforded to Aboriginal people, it seems, for the combination of martial law and deliberate acts of extermination on people who can only be described as prisoners of war ended by banishing or relocating small remnant groups to Flinders Island. It was this action that created the myth that endures today that Tasmanian Aboriginal people did not resist, <coughs> that they were completely annihilated and that is the reason why there are no Aboriginal people in Tasmania today. While there were a number of small wars up and down the East Coast and even further to inland New South Wales, for example, Governor Macquarie was only one of many who declared war on Aboriginal nations such as Gundagara and Darwal peoples. There were also small wars being waged on the Queensland frontier from the very start of the penal settlement at Redcliffe on Moreton Bay in 1824, commenced yet another chapter in penal settlement, uh, another chapter in Aboriginal resistance to the presence of warring foreigners on their lands. But even whilst fighting such wars, Aboriginal people were to be heroes in other ways too. One example was the rescue of shipwrecked people by seven local Aboriginal men around 1847 from the sink sinking ship ironically named the Sovereign. It took 155 years for the Aboriginal men's heroic deeds to be acknowledged <coughs> and recognised with the erection of a monument. But nothing was mentioned about war and or the defence of country. And memorials do not exist that document those wars that were fought, nor the heroes that led their people in defence of country. If Australia was to commemorate those many wars fought on Australian soil and to honour the fallen Aboriginal war heroes, public holidays would fill the entire annual war memorial calendar. At around the same time in Queensland, the leader known as Dundully fought long and hard to cast off the rule of the invading military forces. He led guerrilla war against invaders for over 10 years in an effort to protect his country. Yet he was branded a criminal by whites, but a resistance leader and hero by Aboriginal people. Dundully was executed. He was hung in 1855 for his heroics in defending his country. A brief timeline gives only a few of the wars or battles that were to be part of the early Australian historical landscape. And some of these were 1834, the Battle of Pinjara in Western Australia, 1838 on the 26th of January, 
the Waterloo Creek or Slaughterhouse Creek, or some, sometimes known as the Australia Day Massacre in Camilleroy country in New South Wales. In 1838, the Battle of Broken River, also known as the Faithful Massacre near Benalla, Victoria. One of the few that Europeans conceded was a victory for Aboriginal fighters. In 1838, the Mile Creek Massacre near Inverell, New South Wales. 1830s to the 1840s, the Wiradjuri Wars around Murrumbidgee and Mudgee in New South Wales. But closer to home, here in the Northern Territory, there were the Arnhem Land Wars of the 1880s and 1890s. These were the battles between Yulnu and European invaders. Once again, these battles were as a result of land-grabbing intruders who took massive tracts of land from around the Roper River and well into Arnhem Land. The average size of these parcels of stolen land were around 16,000 square kilometres. Excuse me. And eventually meant the entire Gulf District was taken from Aboriginal people. The taking of this land was also a declaration of war. The land they eventually acquired was the same, as, same size as the state of Victoria and it was all to become pastoral land where Aboriginal people were not welcome. These land grabbing intruders dealt with Aboriginal resistance by employing mercenaries including native police recruitments from other regions to hunt down and kill all inhabitants of the Northern Territory region. In the contemporary context, and in a war theatre scenario, this act of war, war should be described as genocide. Naturally, police and other authorities maintain a conspiracy of silence while this, partic while this particular war raged. This is the war Northern Territory Aboriginal people had no hope of winning, as by 1881 and only 93 years after the landing of British on the East Coast, a pastoral boom in the Northern Territory saw huge cattle stations being allotted to those who had the money to invest and the ensuring war went from 1851 to 1910 saw the loss of approximately 600 Aboriginal lives compared to 20 recorded and registered white deaths. But mostly wars and battles that involved Aboriginal people in invading Europeans and others have been described as massacres or dispersals, and rightly so. However, most of the violent interactions were sparked as a result of the trespassing and the dispossessing of Aboriginal peoples of their lands. It is just that most Australian history and historians refuse to acknowledge this. Exterminations, or perhaps if we use contemporary language, they could be described as ethnic cleansing practices, were widespread and they were relentless. They were frequent as well as devastating as Aboriginal people tried to stand their ground and defend their countries. Essentially, they were at war with an enemy and it was to be a long time for that war to abate. And only after huge numbers of casualties were inflicted right across the entire Australian landscape. Here I share with you one of the many stories of the war on the Northern Territory frontier. Charlie Gaunt, one of the mercenaries who led the warring contingents against Aboriginal peoples, gave a detailed account of one particular encounter with what whites declared the enemy. Below is, is Gaunt's 1892 account of the war on the Barclay Tableland. Smith fired, and the police boy with me fired at the sitting abbo. The black bounced off the ground and fell over into the fire, stone dead. Then pandemonium started. Blacks were rushing to all points only to be driven back with a deadly fire. 
one big abo over six feet, rushed toward the boy and I dropped him in his tracks with a well-directed shot. Later on, when we went through the camp to count the dead, I walked over to this big abo and I was astonished to find, instead of a buck, that it was a splendidly built young lubra, about, I should judge, 16 or 18 years of age. The bullet had struck her on the bridge of the nose and penetrated to the brain. She never knew what hit her. Aboriginal people always resisted what they saw as the stealing of their land, as I said, and they continued to stand up against the levels of violence directed at them. From the earliest days on Australia's east coast and the Tasmanian killing fields, throughout inland New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland and other regions throughout the country. Just like the mighty Kalkadoon people of the Mount Isa region and Battle Mountain in 1884, the Kimberley region in Western Australia from 1890 to 1926, known as the Killing Times, also known as the period of pacification, when the Aboriginal populate, population was decimated. They fought against an enemy with far superior weaponry that saw the loss of the great many young and old fighters, including women. The tactics and weaponry used by whites made for an uneven and an unjust war. From the earlier frontier days and from muskets and cannons and less sophisticated rifles, by the time the white soldiers advanced to the Northern Territory and set up new battlefields, systematically hunting down in what can only be described as terrorist attacks, they used 45 caliber military weapons designed for killing at great distances. So this is what Aboriginal people were up against in the defense of their country. It may have been seen by whites as obstinate resistance but at the same time, Aboriginal people were up against an enemy that had superior strength of numbers, of weaponry, of power and of authority. Spears, boomerangs were no match against the power of an enemy so ruthless and well equipped. But in most confrontations, Aboriginal warriors held their ground and in most cases died in the fight for their country. And by the time Aboriginal people were staging guerrilla warfare on the northern frontier, armed mostly still with stone and wooden weapons and still no tradition of joining forces to fight the common enemy, there could not, there could not be concerted, unified attacks made at single locations. Aboriginal numbers were also small and on top of that, in most locations, numbers dwindled as a result of the deliberate and well-planned executed massacres carried out by whites. Throughout the length of Australian Aboriginal resistance provoked savage vengeance, but not for a moment did whites consider that to a society for whom land is sacred, the environmental destruction must have seemed bad enough, but eviction from important areas had grave social, economic, cultural and health consequences. Dispossession meant much more than losing an asset or even the means of survival. And then there was the deep humiliation and rankle of being hunted from land which had been theirs for countless generations since the land was created. Gordon Lanson, a senior Yanuawa man, was describing calmly on camera how the white men used to come and chase us away. They used to chase us all around the joint. He became somewhat agitated as he reflected upon the injustice of those days, saying angrily, they used to come and chase us from our own land and from our own ground. So while Aboriginal people reacted in a number of complex ways to European invasion in the most part, they waged wars in times of great social upheaval against forces that had little respect for human life and would not consider the idea of coexistence and sharing. Aboriginal people obviously held a number of misconceptions about white society and had expectations 
that never eventuated. Essentially, almost immediately after the first arrival on the shores of this country, and as soon as Aboriginal people observed their bad behaviours and their breaking of Aboriginal laws, and they also realised that Europeans were not interested in respecting or sharing, but were here to steal land and exploit people. Aboriginal people let it be known that they would resist invaders in the defence of their countries. So it is this week, this day, and every day that we should honour and remember our fallen heroes and heroines throughout Australia. This year's NAIDOC theme honours all Aboriginal men and women who have fought in defence of country. And while there are no records that can tell us how many people died as a result of the <coughs> frontier wars, Henry Reynolds rightly points out that usually the numbers of Aboriginal people was normally underestimated. As Reynolds further explains, for the continent as a whole, it is reasonable to suppose that at least 20,000 Aborigines were killed as a direct result of conflict with settlers. From our warriors in the frontier wars, and as we ponder on this year's theme, serving country, centenary and beyond, I proudly highlight and recognise the role of our Aboriginal ancestors um, that they have played in consolidating our identity and I pause to reflect on their great sacrifice in fighting for this country, our home. And I thank them for their priceless contribution to our Aboriginal nation overall. I dedicate these few words today to the memory of, e of the young woman named Whaler who lived approximately from 1800 to 1831, of the Tumajini clan of Tasmania, who was a resistance fighter, sometimes described as the Amazon. As well, I dedicate these words to the young anonymous Aboriginal girl who died in our name on the Arnhem Land frontier. <coughs> Both these women's memorials are enshrined in all of us in the present and set examples for Aboriginal women and men of future generations as a legacy of adjustment, survival and strength. May we always remember them into the next centenary and beyond. For in the words of Ujuru, let no one say the past is dead. The past is all about us and within. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to join me again in thanking Dr. Sue Stanton. What a fantastic presentation. Thank you. I disappear to get my pen. Sue Stanton is an historian, pretty clearly. She's employed by Bachelor Institute of Indigenous Tertiary Education and she teaches and researches and coordinates courses into the Asiki space. She's currently employed, therefore, by Bachelor, but she coordinates the Bachelor of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advocacy. She has an involvement in the Indigenous Land and Sea Management um, stream of that course. She is the coordinator of the Bachelor of Indigenous Languages and Linguistics and also the Diploma of Creative Indigenous creative and Indigenous Writing. So if you're interested in talking to Sue again, there's plenty of opportunities to do so. I'll let you um, ponder some thoughts about maybe questions you have for Sue for the end, because I'd like to move on if you don't mind. So maybe you should note them down in case everything starts to shift into serving and looking after country in the next little stint. Just to remind you, this is a Seeky Talks, episode two. We're dealing with serving country today, and we're hoping um, to bring you episode three in the not too distant future. Uh, serving country, but a little twist on the NAIDOC theme. We're, we're dealing with pre-colonisation, or pre, sorry, pre-centenary and beyond, rather than starting from the centenary of Australia. I must also remind the audience that we are broadcasting live from the Australian Centre for Indigenous Knowledges and Education, and that's live in Darwin, but we also have campuses in Batchelor and in Alice Springs at the Desert People Centre, and my name is Linda McCaffrey. 
Our next guest is the incoming CEO of the North Australia Land and Sea Management Alliance, or NAILSMA, based here in Darwin. Robert, or better known as Bo Khan, is a Jabba Jabba man, but he was born and educated here on Larrakia country. Sometimes I forget to check how to say things and I get a little nervous when I'm saying it. He has 14 years experience working with the Northern Territory Fisheries in Indigenous Development, including establishment of the Marine Ranger Program, the East Arnhem Indigenous Fisheries Network and the Fisheries Indigenous Apprenticeship Program, chairing Indigenous Fisheries Management Committee and he's a member of the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation Indigenous Reference Group. Bo co-authored the Sharks and Stingrays Survey Fisher Fishery Status Report. He has diplomas in teaching and business management as well as a graduate certificate in public sector leadership. Some team awards while with the NT Fisheries include NT Seafood <coughs> Industry Training, National Seafood Industry Training and the Chief Minister's Award. Bo was also awarded the Top End NAIDOC Person of the Year in 2011. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Bo Khan on the importance of land and sea management or caring for country as a form of service to our lands. Bo Khan. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, welcome, everyone. And as you know, um, as Linda mentioned, I'm a Jabba Jabba man. I've also got Bardi linkages. Um, just got to excuse me, I'll be probably a bit nervous until I get to about the second or third slide. Um, so, lucky enough to be born and educated here on Larrakia country. And I'd like to acknowledge my NASMA staff in the room today and um, any other Indigenous people in the room. I've, as the slide says, I've got 14 years experience working with NT Fisheries, a lot with Indigenous groups, um, and then comparing that with 60,000 years, give or take a couple of thousand years with Australian First Nations looking after this beautiful country of ours. And now I've got one week and half a day experience working with NALSMA. <laughs> so I'm going to try and give you um, some idea of what NALSMA do and do my best to use my experiences with fisheries uh, but also learning from my countrymen and uh, people around the NT. So just quickly, I thought I'd share this with you. This is the NALSMA vision and this is one of the key reasons why I decided to leave fisheries and take up the position with NALSMA because I share that same vision and it's quite an important one seeing North Australia is a vibrant region where indigenous traditional knowledge, cultural values and responsibilities to the land and waters are embedded in all environmental, economic and resource management policies and practices. And that's something that I was working, always working hard to do while I was with NT Fisheries. So in doing this, I see NALSMA is trying to promote and share the awareness of the rights and capacity of Indigenous people across the North to own and manage the land and sea resources and show how this adds value to the nation. And when you look at the value to the nation, you've got to then work out how that relates to caring for our resources. And that's one of the key things with Indigenous engagement. Uh, but it's also then having the balance between what Indigenous people have as values to looking after the country and to what non-Indigenous people see. Um, and then the off spin to that is basically having Indigenous people in the workforce is also an added benefit for the nation. But one of the key things that I've always been pushing in, in my employment um, with NT Fisheries was looking at embracing our First Nation people's culture and try and get a real understanding and appreciation for that in looking after country. Um, NAILSMA also look at passing on traditional local knowledge to the younger generation. 
fostering Indigenous excellence and support, supporting partnerships and two-way exchanges. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more a little later, uh, but also improving and sustaining better lives through enterprise and employment. So what NALSMA does, the, in my huge experience working in NALSMA, um, one of the key things I really appreciate is that is always looking at best practice processes and um, governance is always coming up in a lot of things. And um, I also did a overseas scholarship to um, Canada and Washington State in the USA looking at indigenous governance and it was, whilst it was related to fisheries, the key thing was, was that having a governance structure that would allow local autonomy but could give you a broader regional or jurisdictional focus and a stronger voice. So with NALSMA it's about internal capacity building and excellence in governance, clear and defined relationships with indigenous communities, research that enhances indigenous land and sea management and more Indigenous youth in businesses and in science. So these are the programs that NALSMA deliver on. Um, I don't know a lot of detail about many of them. I can, I'll do my best to touch on some of them, but basic carbon abatement is in controlled bushfires um, and looking at offsets, payments, to reduce the amount of carbon going into the environment. Water resource management, I remember uh, while I was even with my fisheries role that Nailsman did a lot of work on trying to get a lot of indigenous engagement and <coughs> participation in water resource management and the allocation of water resources, particularly across the north. Um, so a little disheartening to see how the Northern Territory Government has kind of missed that aspect from all the work that NALSMA has undertaken. Um, they've seen to have done a lot of policy work and disregarded that some of that work. Indigenous knowledge, um, livelihoods, the eye tracker, and as I've just learnt probably in the last couple of days, eye tracker program isn't the little gadget that I thought it was. It's more about the the full program supporting st structure around it. Um, so the eye tracker program is based on a model where you're utilising a cyber tracker gadget, um, but the program itself is worked in a way where individual communities or a range of groups across North Australia um, can put their information or their knowledge within that little system. And then NALSMA will support it through um, training whether it's through workshops or basically going out and doing field work, refresher training and stuff like that. Um, but so the eye tracker program is utilising a technology and it's suitable for low literacy and numeracy um, groups. It's locally adapted, it's world recognised and it, it allows separate applications to even um, where there's might be intellectual property that some Aboriginal groups or Torres Strait Islander groups might have some concern over, but able to have a separate program within that to protect that. Um, so it's culturally appropriate, effective programs based on Indigenous knowledge and contemporary science. It's looking after the country our way, which is un what underpins the programs. Support Indigenous communities to contribute to healthy country and people on their traditional lands. So I'll, I'll just put this to you. So how do, how do Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia, how do we try and explain how we feel about our country? So how do you feel? And so I, I put it in this sense. If you ask a farmer how he feels about his, his land that he's operating on, what values he has for that place, whether it be a farmer for the last 10 years or whether it's a generational 
been there for the, the past hundred years. The same goes for the pastoralist or the commercial fishermen or recreational fishermen, the resource managers, the scientists, and not forgetting indigenous, the original people of this country. And keep in mind that we're also all of those above there. So if, if I was trying to compare this, you could look at 200 years versus 60,000 years of knowledge. I think today's scientists, we're still not quite on the ball with appreciating and understanding what knowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people hold. It wasn't a matter of just sitting on the beach um, watching the sun come up and down every day. A lot of science is still based on data collection. Now that data collection means you're sitting down watching what happens in the environment and you're recording that. So we've got 60,000 years of knowledge on that. And whilst those stories that we tell about those things might not suit the scientific model, that's still our science. And I'll give you a quick example there. So um, I used the same example at a conference last week. An old fella in East Arnhem Land, when I first joined fisheries 14 years ago, told me that he's a saltwater man through and through and that his knowledge is that life began in the sea. Everything's salt, your sweat is salt, your tears are salty, your blood is salty. And that, that's why he knows life began in the sea. And he used to tell me that story a few times. When I first heard it, I thought, oh, that's great, you know, that, that's a good story. Um, but I kept my fisheries a very narrow focus, government had on for a lot of years. <coughs> and this old fellow kept telling me that story and I heard it over and over again. And it was only a few months ago when I was watching TV and it was the Living Planet or something was on there and, they, and the fellow says, the narrator says, um, yes, 600 million years ago life began in the sea and I nearly fell off the lounge chair. <laughs> but I got straight on the phone and rang him up and said, wow, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I'm trying to get to with that is that when we talk about, um, you know, what um, people would consider dreamtime stories or, or some even narrow it right or put it right down to call it folklore in, 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 our, in our stories when how the land was created and how we were created. What we've got to understand is if, if, if an Aboriginal person says that hill, there's, you can't disturb that hill because that's where the serpent's sitting or something's in that hill and if you disturb it, something bad's going to happen might not necessarily mean there's a serpent in there. Maybe there's something in that hill that could upset the environment is, or could upset the landscape. So there's some truth to that, but we've just got to work out what it is. And, and it really comes down to listening to Aboriginal people in the first place. But what I want to get to here is what I've also seen is I went to a workshop in South Australia going back in 2009 and that was a fisheries managers workshop. And they had fisheries managers, fisheries scientists from all across Australia and New Zealand, over 200 people in the room. And NT Fisheries sent me down because they didn't think there was any indigenous people in the room. And they were right, I was the only one in there. But I was there as a fisheries person. And so when people were talking stories about it and they put up the commercial fishing sector, the recreational fishing sector, the aquaculture sector, they weren't put in the indigenous fishing sector. So I'd put my hand up and I put my hand up and I kept saying, what about the indigenous? And they'd write it up on the bottom, which is what I've got on the screen here. And they kept doing that. And for the first half of the day, I kept putting my hand up and do it. After lunch, I was a bit satisfied with a full tummy, so I stopped. And when they were talking those stories, I thought, I'm not gonna say it anymore. And then finally, someone else in the room put their hand up and said, oh, don't forget the indigenous. Now, where we are today is, I recently went to a workshop in South Australia again. Um, this time there was about 100 managers there and I was asked to talk. But before I got up to talk, I saw the executive director for the FRDC who were running this workshop, uh, the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation. 
Um, so he got up and when he opened the talk, he said, when we're talking fisheries management and science across Australia, we're talking about the indigenous fishing sector, the commercial fishing sector, the recreational fishing sector. So he just did that. So he's just turned it around, he's put the indigenous first. That's not trying to say that it's, it's the more important one, he's just trying to say it's no longer an add-on, that it's something that we should be at the forefront of our minds. So which way? I see a good way from here, having government policy to ensure Indigenous engagement at all levels of research and management. And the only example I can think of here is the Northern Territory Fisheries today has an has a internal policy that basically says that if they're going to do any future research, fisheries research in the Northern Territory, that the Executive Director will not approve it or support it unless they've shown how they're going to engage with Aboriginal communities or Aboriginal Sea Ranger groups. And to me, that is a really big step. And I think um, NT Fisheries need to be applauded for that. And I would like to start seeing other government agencies to take that, take that role on as well. But also look at um, fee-for-service models. Comes back to governance again. So good governance models for Indigenous engagement, but also partnerships with universities, governments, Indigenous organisations in industry. They're all important. We can't be expected to do these things alone because it's not, it's not what, how we impact on the environment. I haven't seen too many cases or studies showing how Indigenous impact is, is ruining our environment. It tends to be outside influences that are doing it. So Aboriginal people need to be part of the solution. And the other, the other one is all looking at business enterprise. So is the grass greener? The grass is greener. So you need to drive your own work. Don't expect someone else to, to come in and, and do the driving for you. Do what you've been obligated to do. Worry about your country, but just remember it doesn't stop at your boundary. If it's saltwater country, for example, the, that barramundi doesn't know that he's crossed boundaries. The turtle and jurong don't know about boundaries. So you might be very good at managing your country, uh, but remember, acknowledge your neighbours and look at how you can work together. So you'll see a word in there that wasn't a that wasn't a spelling error. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've heard of coopetition. If you haven't, I could register that as a trademark, yeah. maybe. Um, no, I had heard that somewhere else, and it, um, it is actually from uh, the Inuit in Alaska that I'd first heard it. So coopetition basically means that um, you're, you work in cooperation while you can still compete on things or it means you can still cooperate even with your enemies. Um, so for me, I took that on, on with an Aboriginal perspective that, you know, I don't pretend that um, <coughs> all my family even get along with each other, let alone get along with the neighbouring tribal groups or other nations around the coast. And that's okay, we don't have to. But what you can do is look at what values you share, what visions you share, <coughs> And then you take those forward and you work together to make sure you, you get to your visions and your aims and goals. Um, and a simple analogy may be that if, there's a, if you're on country and there's a weed that's coming over your country and you have to go and buy sprays to kill this weed um, and the next door neighbour has to go and buy that and the neighbour beside them and beside them and beside them, um, it would be a lot cheaper if you just all chipped in and bought it in bulk and then utilised and spread it out from there. So in conclusion, it's about working with other people. It's partnering with those that share your vision and your values. If, you, if you're not caring for your country, 
then you're also not defending it. Um, and that's what I have to say anyway. Thank you. <laughs> of course, I'm going to ask you again to join me in thanking Bo Khan from Nailsma. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll drop my pen again. Um, Bo Khan, as you know, is the incoming CEO of the North Australia Land and Sea Management Alliance, or NASMA, based here in Darwin, and they've been doing great work for many years. Thank you also for coming from the NASMA group. I'd like to open it to the floor now, although we only have a few minutes left. We could probably use all five of them. If you've got a question, please raise your hand, and Karen will bring your microphone for either of our guests, Dr. Sue Stanton or Bo Khan. Brave up, somebody. Good on you, Leo. Thanks. Um, it's actually a sort of a question, but it's more a statement. I just thought it was um, fantastic, Sue, the way you explained to us really, really well the history. Like, we all kind of know it, but I love the way you explained it. And a lot of people around Australia, I'm sure, will just really love it, especially Aboriginal. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lenore. Any other questions? We're coming to you live from the Australian Centre for Indigenous Knowledges and Education. This is a Seeky Talks, episode two. And we're looking to, to the floor for further questions before we wrap it up. I was just wondering, Sue, whether you knew of any moves by the Education Department to have some of that information placed into sort of school knowledge? Um, yes, I, I believe that there is a move to teach more Aboriginal history in schools, but of course there'll be very sanitised versions. That And um, before I go any further, I'd like to apologise that I didn't um, warn um, Lenore and, and you, you know, about the confronting stuff that I was going to talk about, because I know it can be very confronting and, and to the other Aboriginal member, uh, women in the room. Um, but yes, um, in the schools, uh, well, I think that we don't teach enough history as it is. Um, when I was at that multicultural um, workshop, I expected that kind of response from people from the ethnic community because they get told certain things about Aboriginal people before they even get to this country. And, um, and it's usually bad and it's not good history or um, a good image of us. but. I'm really saddened that a lot of our own Aboriginal young people don't know enough of their history. I mean, we all have our family stories, that's true, and we all talk about them, we know our family histories, um, but I don't think we look at it the big picture anymore. We're forgetting about history, and I think it's just too important, you know, that we should incorporate it into everything in our workplace, in our learning and teaching and everything. Any further questions? Um, Michaela this is, from this is actually uh, a suggestion or a comment rather than a, a, um, a question. Sorry, Sue. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, I think we should actually play that first part of Asiki Talks and the second part too uh, um, by both speakers to uh, Tony Abbott, our Prime Minister, who said that Australia was not settled or scarcely settled. I'm sure um, he's a big watcher of the Australian Public Affairs Channel, don't you I, think? Oh, I think so, I think yeah. He'd be tuned in yeah, regular. I'm sure he is. That's <laughs> why he's so so knowledgeable on current affairs and, and, and history. <laughs> well, I was actually a bit worried uh, because I believe Nova Paris has got a bunch of hate mail yes. um, today. Um, today in relation to her attack on the Prime Minister. Um, and I was thinking, oh my, I'm used to that. <laughs> Bring it on. No, yeah. But, I mean, uh, another reason why history is important is about what Bo's talking about, how we practice that and know about our country and, and the effects on it um, and how we should look after it from well, all different perspectives, not just from that caring for country, but knowing mm. the history of that country and appreciating it too. But, yeah, old Tony Abbott, well, you know... Broadcasting live. 
<laughs> Better not say too much. <laughs> I need my job. That's it. Any further questions? Um, and um, as uh, as Sue had mentioned about Gurindji and um, Kanarik and Warai countries, um, just be aware that um, situations like you described did actually happen on our country with our people. So as close to Darwin as Bachelor, where the other C one of the other Siki campuses are, yeah. And I think you were right; it was very confronting. And if you would have gone even closer to that, I think it would have been much more. Well, it's still in a lot of people's memories, yeah. you know. You hear old people talking about some of this stuff. Um, thank you both very much. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, I teared up because the three of the examples that you spoke about mm. are my family. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask, why do you think that the broader Australian community has so much trouble talking about Indigenous Australia and difference and diversity within the same question. Why are we still battling with a picture of indigeneity that is way, way, you know, a long way away from where we are now? Wow. Well, I have a problem with the contemporary use of the word indigenous. I don't use it if I can avoid it. And I think that's what's taken away from our identity. I mean, I know we've had several names I mean, as a kid, I went from being a coloured to a half-caste to a <laughs> Aboriginal, and now I've got to run around saying I'm Indigenous. You know, it's like I don't have a problem with my identity, but it seems white Australia does. But um, I think that whole concept of Indigenous has taken, removed for white followers some of the responsibility of Aboriginal history. So what I appeal to young Aboriginal people, or all Aboriginal people, put the Aboriginal back into Aboriginal, take out the Indigenous, because I think the Indigenous thing is doing us an injustice. I hope I answered that a little bit. I'd love to carry on with that and I'd like to give Bargo, but I think that's a good place to leave it because we've just hit one o'clock and that means our hour is up. I'd like to thank you and uh, very much to all of you for coming to join us here in the room today. That's very kind of you. And uh, Asiki Talks will, of course, return. But first, uh, many thanks to our special guest, Asiki's senior lecturer, Dr. Sue Stanton. <laughs> and Nailsma's incoming CEO, Bo Khan. <laughs> and just lastly, I'd like to thank the Australian Public Affairs Channel for taking this uh, particular episode of Asiki Talks. We'll be back for episode three, but before episode three probably happens will be the Vincent Lingiari Memorial Lecture, which Charles Darwin University presents on the 21st of uh, August, and it's usually around the walk-off date, so it's, uh, it's the Thursday night, the 21st of August, in the Malnan Auditorium. We're starting a bit earlier this year, so you can spread the word. It starts at about five o'clock, and the lecture starts at about six. So please stay tuned for that. Um, until then, I'd like to also thank my Seeky colleagues for helping me very much today and every day. Simon Says TV and Alex, who's holding that camera at the back, very important. And of course, uh, the Australian Government, who provides the structural adjustment funds to the Australian tertiary sector, which funds my work and the work that my colleagues do. And we thank them very much. Until next time, I'm Linda McCaffrey. Thanks for coming.